Well, hello there. Welcome to the second podcast for the Pacific War Channel, where we are going to be talking about the last episode I did, which was on the disaster that led to the Opium Wars. Here with my friend Justin, and yes, it's not a Zoom call this time, as the quality was quite terrible, as you can imagine. Sorry about that, folks, but uh, glad to be here. Hopefully it ends up uh, being a nice little chat. If you guys remember me from the last episode, I'm not a historian by nature. My studies were actually in economics, uh, and I'm interested to learn a little bit more about what happened with the Pacific War and all the things that went into it, especially since a lot of the causes themselves were economically based. So hopefully Craig can shed a little light on exactly what went into some of those things and maybe I'll do a little digging of my own and see what we can find out. Yeah, so just like he said, much like most of you viewers were from, you know, the United States, the Western world, you're probably not familiar with what we're talking about because this is Asian history. Even myself, uh, we're here in Canada. I'm lucky that my university even had any courses that remotely touch the subject. You can barely find this. It's really a specialization and it's not found so much in the Western world. Luckily for Justin, the topic of this episode is based on economics. As anyone could probably guess, almost every single war that's ever occurred in history revolves around economic or trade relations gone sour. And this one is probably one of the greatest examples in history where economics led to war. And this was the disaster that led to the Opium Wars. So. I was thinking as far as going along with this podcast and making this more of a reoccurring um, show, I would ask my friend Justin here three very simple questions. And the first one would be, well, what did you think of the episode? I'm sorry, was I supposed to watch the episode? You were. No, yeah. just kidding, guys. Uh, I thought the episode was very good, um, you know, leading into just kind of the causes of the, uh, the Opium War and go figure conflict kind of deriving from a drug trade you know which is not uncommon even nowadays um but it's interesting to see how the whole world back then revolved around several very simple commodities that are commonly accessible nowadays like tea or silk or things like that but that actually drove almost entire nations economies um so as far as the episode, it was very enlightening as to kind of what led up to the war. I'm interested to see exactly what, how that progressed and what, what happened to the trades themselves. Because like you said, there was a lot of back and forth as oh. to where, you know, what was going to happen with the opium trade. The, China was trying to abolish it. Britain kind of was depending on it. So depending on where that went, there could have been a lot of big changes to certain nations. Um, so that's... Uh, that's basically where I'm at. You know, uh, in case you didn't watch the episode, just to summarize it, because it is a complicated issue. What ended, what really encompasses this whole situation was two addictions. Britain had literally become addicted to tea. And that sounds humorous, but it's quite true. Gotta get that Earl Grey. Yeah. We're not talking about just economic dependency. Actual addiction. The people who lived in the British Empire require tea. It was... Part of the social fabric tea time was very important and the more and more they consumed the more and more they needed so what ended up happening is where did they get tea back then mostly from china china had a very interesting trading network um that we would call a little bit rigid it was a tributary system and the only way you could trade with china was through using silver now, Britain had silver for most of its history, but during this time period, Britain began to see a decline in its silver surplus. It uh, had a war with the United States, as most of you are probably Americans. After the American Revolution, Britain uh, had a lot of war debt, so it was running out of silver as it was. But by trading so much with China, it was running out of silver even more. There was a trade deficit with China. So China was basically hoarding all the silver it could, 
not throwing that out there and, you know, selling tea willy-nilly. And uh, Britain found itself in a bit of a pickle. They did not have the silver to get the tea. Their citizens required the tea or there would be unrest. And Britain had to look elsewhere. How were they going to get all this tea out of China? What they ended up finding was there was a rather dark way of doing so. You see, Britain during this time period also acquired India, basically as a colony. Could go into a whole other episode about how that works out because it's a lot more complicated than that. But uh, India is where they cultivated opium. Now, members of Britain who worked for the East India Company eventually got their hands, well, they monopolized it. They ended up being the ones who could trade the opium and they started to smuggle the opium into China. And this started off really small scale, but it started to build up over time and it was very successful. They would sell the opium in China, get the silver, trade that for tea, bring it back home, make that money. And there was a fine equilibrium that was going on. It was not the intention of anybody in Britain or the East India Company to break this equilibrium. They didn't want to poke the bear too much. They wanted the Chinese, you know, the corrupt ones who were going along with this to just keep it mellow. Because the Chinese government, of course, wanted, you know, to get rid of the opium trade. This is an illicit drug and it was ruining their society. But it wasn't too bad for quite a while. Eventually, and this is what really sprang it, the Industrial Revolution occurred and the, um, the steam engine was created. Britain was building up its textile network which would start to dominate the world. And they needed to sell their textile works, you know, um, to other places, which ended up being India. Problem with that, they started to sell so much of this textile stuff to India, the Indians only had one way to really pay for it. Opium. So they made more opium, more opium went to China, blah 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 blah. All of a sudden everybody in China is addicted to opium and it's completely collapsing their society. People were going to work, people were going to, you know, opium dens and the stereotypical kind of racist things that we see in our head from those cartoon characters, you know, were actually playing out. It was ruining Chinese society and the emperor freaked out. He started to lash out and these, you know, lame bands that they were doing, which were like, oh, we don't want opium, you know, they put all these edicts, became actual, we're gonna hunt you down, we're gonna, you know, arrest you and, and murder, you know, we'll execute you and stuff. And it got out of hand and this is what ends up resulting in a war. So my episode, you know, goes into the finer details of how we get from point A to Z. It's a little bit more complicated than I'm saying here, but just to summarize, it was basically one addiction from one empire to another, opium and tea. And interestingly, it's kind of interesting that I say it like that because the book I used as reference for most of this, the title is The Opium Wars, The Addiction of One Empire and the Corruption of Another, which I thought was a fantastic title because it really summarizes it. And I went on to a long tangent. Uh, but uh, I've got to ask you, what did you know about this subject at all before watching this episode? Well, I knew that a lot of the trade back then revolved around silver. And although I haven't done extensive research, I'm pretty sure a lot of the world silver was also coming out of Spain or uh, yeah. the, the Spanish involvement in the silver trade was very, very strong. But I believe them too, they were hoarding a lot of it for themselves. They called it the uh, Spanish bullion for a reason. W which, is, which is what led it to have somewhat of a shortage in other countries, especially since Spain didn't really have any other resources that they were trading highly at the time. So a lot of the silver that was coming out wasn't necessarily getting elsewhere in the world. And like he said, with the, with the Revolutionary War, Britain found itself to be in quite the pickle when it comes to how to pay for their stuff. Because uh, Britain as well didn't really have any national exports at the time or nothing major. Uh, no, there wasn't too much. They, like I said, the textile industry was what they were trying, you know, in the Industrial Revolution, that became their staple, what they were trying to sell. But other than that, I mean, <laughs> there's a reason why they were into piracy. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, I haven't researched this myself, but I'm going to guess because, because things didn't work out with China, I'm guessing China's need for textile specifically wasn't very high, which is why Britain couldn't work anything out uh, yes. in a straight trade for tea type of thing. I didn't mention that uh, they did try to sell textiles to China directly to uh, pay for the tea, but unfortunately China preferred its silk, traditional wear, and uh, it was even trading with Korea and Japan who had superior, well actually I won't say they were superior silk, but uh, 
their trading partners in the area of you know textiles they were covered and they saw the british textile work as cheap and it was cheap and that's what it was <laughs> and kind of a funny twist of events now uh china's more known for having the uh yeah the yeah. the knockoff stuff but uh it comes full circle if you think about yeah, it yeah it, it almost does but yeah i it, did it, it's funny how even in those days, just most nations had such limited exports that it wasn't possible to make a whole roundabout trade where where Britain would trade with Spain to get more silver in order to deal with China. They had to find a way to deal with it directly, which unfortunately uh, didn't seem to work out for them because they found themselves in too well, much need for the tea and unable to supply it in any other way. And, you know, naturally when you're importing that much of an addictive substance into a nation, it's going to cause long-term problems. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, writing this episode was actually extremely awkward. I did not start off by writing a episode with the idea of what led up to the Opium Wars. I was writing an episode on, oh, the first Opium War, which ended up being about 35 pages of script. And to give an idea here, you know, like 12 pages, you're getting in like the 30 minute range when I'm on screen. So it's like, oh my God, I'm going to have to break this up. And the next episodes will be on the first and the second Opium War, which are both at 40 minutes a piece, I believe. So you're welcome for shortening this one up a little bit. And uh, it's, uh, it's a rabbit hole. The more you learn about just the economics behind most of this, the crazier it gets. And the more, you know, you learn about shadow guilds, like the Kohog merchants that I briefly mentioned in this, and how much control they had over the Qing dynasty. They were the middlemen between, like, you know, the Creed de Bois over here with the fur trade and stuff. And without them, the Qing dynasty would not have flourished, but they were corrupt in such a way that they were ruining their own people, basically. Now, was that kind of similar to what was happening in the U.S. in the olden days, where these uh, shadow guilds were mostly controlling the ports, so to speak? Yeah, it's exactly And they it. were direct middlemen between what was coming in and what uh, got fed into the country? Yeah, the way uh, the Qing Dynasty worked things, basically they were supposed to have a, um, a Taipan, um, um, a chief executive who would, you know, see what goes in, what goes out. Fortunately, this guy was being paid off by the co-op merchants. So they would be the guys on the docks meeting with the foreigners, the barbarians, which would be our Western Westerners, or even the Japanese or Koreans in this case. And they would be the middlemen. So they would control what actually was going in, what actually was going out, because they were paying off the tariff officials, you know, saying, hey, you already checked this boat, right? Slide, slide them some money. Boat goes through, and the boat said, oh, it was just fish or whatever. No, it was full of opium, etc. And these guys were doing this for so long, and they were directly working with East India Company. This was all, like, people, people like to think this is, oh, oh, horrible. The British, you know, they abused the Chinese and the system that they did. It was barbaric what they did. No, 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 no. Both nations were corrupt. Both nations were in on this at some level. The idea that one side was just brutally outplaying the other it's not true a lot of people profited off this and you know what the Qing dynasty officials profited off of this they they put on a good show with their bands and everything but they were fine with everything until society was collapsing yeah well uh, sorry for audio listeners if you hear this but it's been a long day of writing and the, uh, I guess the third question I would ask you, since we're going off these interview questions that I've laid out, would be, you know, what did you learn from this? Which I would have to say would probably be a lot since it's a subject no one would really know about in the Western world. Well, you know, we've, we've covered this in previous podcasts, whereas that as a Westerner in our education system, the, there is almost no basis for any form of Asian or European history. And although we do touch on Great Britain a little bit, uh, it's it's uh, after Columbus discovered America, which is another debated subject. It's it's it, it gets very vague. Seriously, thinking about it, we both went to uh, the same high school. We both, you know, we know what we learned in high school. In high school, you learn Egypt, ancient Greece, Rome, Europe. And then the Americas. No you mention. You know better than me. You actually went to those classes, so. <laughs> no, no mention of. I, I don't think I've ever heard any mention of China. But I mean, this is 
early 2000s when we went to high school, mind you. Maybe things have changed, but it, yeah. it's true. We don't hear about one of them, the oldest civilization. <laughs> No, but even going to a base college course, I mean, all we ever had was Western civilization, unless you yeah, were that's true. specifically into history uh, uh, yeah. as as a focus, then th that's all we got. But the thing I enjoy about a lot of these episodes is, like I said, most of these older conflicts are all in some way economically based. Mm -hmm. And studying the way that economies worked back then compared to how they work now is actually something that interests me. I haven't had a chance to really go into details in a lot of these specific conflicts, but it's it it really does show that trade was everything back then. It's still it, in almost all history, even today, you can argue argue every major conflict has an economic rationale. I think the best one for the audience would be because you know anyone who's watching this is probably a World War II buff. What if I told you that World War II could be summed up simply by problems with economics and not ideology? If you want to really look at it, and this is really boring for a lot of people, people don't like the history of economics, but Adolf Hitler was not necessarily in full control of the Third Reich. He actually had a consortium of industrial conservatives who were running most of the country, like Krupps Corp and uh, anyone who's making arms. And people like, you know, Herring Goring, who worked <laughs> worked for Hitler while he was on drugs, uh, he brushed shoulders with a lot of these people. And you had to keep them happy because Germany was not financially doing well ever during World War II or before. They were horrifyingly not doing well. And the people were being told lies about how much trade was going on. You see, Hitler had a very internal economy. And the only way to keep his government or him in charge was, you know, make sure things were okay. And that inevitably led to the expansion, which was being pushed by the industrialists who were selling arms. So in essence, you could argue the people who were really in control were the ones selling and designing these arms. Hitler, and a lot of people are going to find this controversial, he might have been pushed to start some of the wars at the very beginning you, that you saw in 1939. Anyways, am I going to go any deeper yeah, into that? But not, similarities. Not, not, not to get on a tangent, because you know we're we're moving from the rev yeah. from the yeah. uh, the opium war to World War Two here. But just for those who like uh, comparisons a little bit, talking about internalizing a lot, you know, it almost sounds like somebody we know from nowadays. Uh, from now on, it's America first. Buy American, sell American, yeah. work American. It it sounds kind of familiar. Just throwing that out there. Even our country, the slogan right now is. Canada first or something, they're saying. Oh, uh, yeah. But it's... it works. It does work. That's a good slogan, I guess. Uh, you but... know what? Americans, uh, American Revolution, was it for, you know, for, was it for, for freedom or was it taxation without representation? You know, all of it came down to the T tax, if you think about it. So, yeah. another trade disagreement. A lot of governors of some free states, they didn't want to pay Great Britain. <laughs> <laughs> led yeah. to a war <laughs> yeah but i would be interested to see what uh what part spain played in all this because it would seem uh, if well, they had been willing to at least part with some of their resources which at some point they have to live to they need to eat everybody who's anybody was out looking for indian spice at that time and india being sort of sort of a british colony at the time you would have figured there was some way to work around it Oh, well, but, actually, yeah, well, I, I can go into this because uh, in university I, I did take a lot of pre-colonial and colonial Spanish uh, history courses because I really was interested well, in, in Incan culture. But anyways, for after colonization, um, Spain, yes, yeah, Spain was um, one of the most powerful nations in the world for a long time and they had a surplus of silver, which no one else did. And their war chest was so large that, you know, it was one of the things that broke a system that was being built in Europe where no nation was trying to allow another nation to get too powerful. They would gang up on whoever was getting too big. But Spain at one point got too big for everybody. And you saw that when, uh, well, when basically they were putting everybody on certain thrones and stuff. But anyways, this led Britain into a uh, full-length century of piracy you know uh, pirates of the caribbean all that comes from when britain was stealing specifically from spain because spain would take silver from the new world and bring it over and about a third of that would make it back because of corrupt spanish officials and the british were stealing it left right and center 
And even with all the silver that Britain stole from Spain, which was an unbelievable amount, they ran into debt eventually, and that led to this. That's a lot of tea, folks. That is a lot of tea. Yeah. Now, these interview questions are pretty much over. I really wanted this to be informal because my my episodes are f basically exactly what you would get out of a university course. I took a course specifically on the Pacific War, and I've even noticed through my own research, I'm almost mirroring what my professors did. I started at a similar time period, and I tried to build up around the same kind of events, even though I don't feel my professors touched the Opium Wars as much as I did, uh, but it's rigid. And as the audience, you know, I want you to see more behind the scenes, like, you know, history should be fun, it should be... The same things that I noticed when I was in, you know, in university. I go to a bar with a few of my colleagues, and we just would argue about some random century feud between two countries at some point. Like I don't know, you know, was the American Revolution necessary, or was it just really an accident that occurred because a bunch of governors didn't want to pay some taxes or something like that? So, Justin. After watching an episode looking at the economics that led Britain and later some other countries, uh, you'll see in the episodes further, into war with China, what do you really think? It's really a tough sell because you have to argue that the, the whole crisis started from an addiction. Yeah. I, I think we can all agree that even back then tea was not a necessity. Not at all. But most of the world's trade back then, like I said, also revolved around Indian spice, which I'm sorry, but Not was, 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 wasn't necessary to make people live. But back then... Most, well, I mean, in Britain, you couldn't eat the food, really. <laughs> th this is true. But back then, you know, mo most things were all based on social status. Yeah. It wasn't a question of whether you were alive and had food in your belly or not, but it was a question of did you have tea or did you have coriander or cumin or whatever it was so you know so social status would was kind of a large basis for how well you were doing in life uh how much money you made how big your house was this and this and that so in a sense it was a necessity for england to acquire this amount of tea and at the same time kind of you know quench their quench their thirst not not to make a stupid pun but uh, to kind of satisfy their addiction and the fact that they had no other means of trading for this, like he said, despite all of the silver they managed to pillage and attain legally, it, they really had no other option but to, but to offer this in trade. And what they didn't count on is this completely crashing the entire Chinese society. Um, is, is there a question of who's the bad guy in this? I Ooh. think I, I I think Craig's right in the fact that both nations were very very corrupt. I, I'll still say Britain w wins the bad guy in this still, but China should not be let off the hook. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, it, it seems like both nations were still very corrupt, like you said, with uh, sort of shadowy gangs controlling the ports and things like that. I mean, th these are not things that are unheard of, but. It just seems to be that there, there's no, there's no, there's no moral high ground in this. Absolutely not. But both nations did kind of what they had to do. Unfortunately, it led to a decrease in, let's say, the quality of life. Oh, and boy. It, and it ended up in, in quite the little problem. You know, I'll just go ahead and say that uh, it gets much worse. Um, I'll be like I, I mentioned previously. I'll be doing the next two episodes, which will be the first Opium War and the second Opium War, both about forty minutes long, and I barely can even touch the surface of uh, the social unrest because you can argue that the Qing Dynasty. This is um, the first nail in the coffin um, for a dynasty that was doing comparatively quite well. If you look at the world, uh, a lot of the world was ungoverned and going through warring states periods even china wasn't really unified at this point what was chinese is even until 1911 is not really defined well and i mean the qing dynasty had so many problems at home that it's almost it's insult to injury that britain got involved the way it did because they were weak they were simply weak and a vulnerable target 
Um, it's sad. <laughs> it's, re it's really sad. Well, I won't talk about like the future of my content, but uh, it's hard not to vilify the British in the end. And it, it goes without saying, most of the literature that's written today just simply rags on the British for what they did. But I, I really do want to bring up some of the issues of who was corrupt in China because there's heroic people like Lin Zhezhu who I did mention in this episode briefly he's more in the next one he he's almost uh, he's a hero of China he's on some of their their bills he he really did fight to rid this addiction from his people but there's other people in China who were completely complicit and just making money and they didn't care most of the, the social upheaval did nothing to them because they weren't living amongst the commoners. And the common Chinese people are always the ones who get absolutely messed over. It's going to get really rough. Um, there's going to be a rebellion. There's many rebellions that happen in China. But uh, I did one episode specifically that will come in the future called the Taiping Rebellion. And this event, which many Westerners probably never heard of, the amount of death is only surpassed by World War II. It was something like 20 to 30 million people died, all in China. This is a civil war, quote unquote, and it actually, you could argue, comes from this, the Opium Wars, and what Britain kind of started. Now, is that what ended the Ming Dynasty, or? Uh, it's another um, nail in the coffin, as I'll call it. Um, and this is the Qing Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty oh, was uh, for oh, but it's very confusing. Even myself, I am not a scholar of uh, Chinese history. I I'm, I know much more about Japanese history, and that's what I studied. Uh, but I had to educate myself to do this episode. The Ming Dynasty was overthrown by the Qing Dynasty. Uh, the only way to really describe it is the the Qing Dynasty has a um, strong Manchu element to it. There's many groups in China during this time period. The Manchu, um, for lack of better words, let's call them northern Chinese from our point of view and okay. this also incorporates the Mongolians and um, the Ming were more Han Chinese it, it's so it's, it's impossible to even even not myself I'm ignorant towards all of this but you should always remember during this time period there's Manchu Chinese Han Chinese there's a lot of Mongolians involved and then the Mandarins who are usually court officials and they're all quote-unquote different people but there's also subgroups there's uh, Hakka is a minority group in China that exists today there's many different indigenous Chinese that no one would even remotely know the name of and they're you know they have their small pieces and they have, there's all sorts of rebellions that go on of uh, I won't talk about current-day China because that's like a cat of worms and there's other things going on but uh, yeah like I said at I think at the beginning it's a it's a rabbit hole the more you learn, the more it just gets much more complicated. And when I write these scripts, like for this one particularly, I ended up getting so transfixed on the uh, the Kohog Merchant Guild, which was the shadowy guys we're talking about, the corrupt ones. And I'll talk a bit them. I'll talk about them a bit more in the next episode. But uh, I could have done a whole episode on them because they don't go away. And they started. They're not the triads, uh, but they brush shoulders with them eventually. What the triads kind of become in the 20th century and it's interesting because the triads uh, are some of the pushers for some of these rebellions that end up overthrowing the Qing Dynasty and Kung Fu is involved in this too interestingly enough yeah wow yeah so as you can imagine I can keep going on tangents about different things but uh, I guess another question will come up, and especially to our audience, since this is the Pacific War Channel, what the absolute hell does this have to do with the Pacific War, you might be asking. I wasn't asking that at all, but to be honest, I haven't the faintest clue. The only thing I would think about is with all this trading going on, control of the Pacific probably would have been very important. And... Uh, it probably had something to do with the conflicts that were going on there in terms of getting these trade routes opened up. But that's the only thing I could possibly think of. Yeah, the uh, the trade networks on land, as anyone knows in Western uh, civilization, they were being, uh, you know, for a while it was the Mongolians controlled the Silk Road and then the, um, the Turks ended up 
stopping a lot of this and there was kind of a disconnect between Asia and the rest of Europe and they had always traded for quite a while. So then eventually when the sailing was able to go over the Cape Horn of South Africa, they were able to trade more. And this is why Britain ends up where it is in China. But really the people that are kind of controlling the world of trade are the Dutch. Uh, they're very much involved at this time. They're still controlling certain places in Southeast Asia and the Portuguese for the beginning half uh, were the ones that really opened this up because they were kind of the great explorers. Go figure, you know, learning about the Americas and everything. And uh, later on, uh, America will be the ones who kind of... <laughs> well, I mean, the door was kicked down by Britain and America kind of just settled in when, uh, when things got uh, interesting for money. Feisty. Yeah. And America will come into this eventually. This is... America was somewhat involved in the Second Open War, but not officially. They, uh, they had their hand to play. They were always watching. I mean, America was young. They, they weren't uh, what they are today. But <laughs> by the beginning of the 21st century, it's America, America, America. <laughs> yeah, everywhere. And uh, how does this uh, at all have anything to do with the Pacific War? Um, if you were taking a class on the Pacific War, they most likely would start either in China, like I think they should, because I think it's very important to know China's 50% of the piece of this puzzle. And a lot of people forget that and they focus on Japan. Uh, but usually a Pacific War class would focus on the Meiji Restoration, which is the opening of Japan when um, Commodore Matthew Perry, you know, officially opens Sokoku Japan and Japan basically modernizes in like 20 years and becomes a tyrant of the Pacific. Uh, but China, was, you know, the big guy on the block for, for forever. He was big brother and Japan was little brother. And this is a period where China finally gets hurt enough where Japan is able to take advantage and overthrow China, which we'll see later in history. But as far as the Pacific War is concerned, China was an ununified warring state. And eventually this quasi dynasty that kind of controlled everything gets toppled and it's a result of Westerners. Now this left a, a grievance and it's a grievance that you can even feel today in China. Uh, Westerners came in and we started to you know make unequal treaties, we were abusing them like you know well, I'm saying us, uh, Britain or any other Western country did. That's it's absolutely true. We uh, absolutely abused all the countries that we tried to colonize and we're taking advantage of them and trying to strip them of resources etc. These grievances just basically pile up and then cause the Pacific War because we dragged Japan into China as a result of this conflict eventually and Japan started to beat on China in order to prove itself to the rest of the world and I know I'm butchering this as a summarization but this led to a cataclysm of events where China was continuously humiliated and continuously being destroyed within itself by factions that wanted to fight for power to control it. And China never was stable. After this period, it basically, this is when it starts being completely unstable and it never recovers. We go from First Opium War, Second Opium War, there's rebellion, there's about 10 rebellions in this century, Taiping Rebellion, Boxer Rebellion, Japan comes in and is involved in that, humiliates China. China then goes to war with Japan in the first Sino-Japanese War, which they never recovered over. And well, it's kind of historically... It's almost like an axiom where if there's any big power that's in some kind of civil unrest, yeah. there's always going to be economic and financial crumbs from the fallout. Any, any type of business they have, whether it be trade, whether it be production, export, things like that, they're going to fall apart when there's civil unrest. And it's normal that if China was so damaged internally at the time, that a lot of other countries, these mice, so to speak, which some of which were very powerful as well, but th they see all these crumbs as opportunity. So it makes sense that they would go in and kind of try to bite at the heels and take little bits where they want, whether it be taking over trade routes or trying to establish control in certain regions to control certain exports. And, um, you know, I guess a lot of these smaller conflicts really help build up towards what would have been the Pacific War or 
other conflicts in and around that time period. It's actually funny you mentioned the crumbs because there's uh, there's actually many things you can look up as a, a cartoon image and it's always referred to as a pie. China was a piece of pie that a bunch of countries by the end of this century dug into to grab a piece of and they yep. literally designated territories for themselves. Um, you know, if you look at it's Shanghai that gets kind of cut up into these pieces and Japan ended up being one of these people and they were considered like the rest of the western world you know this aggressor who took a piece of the pie and as far as china's concerned china was big brother forever and then all of a sudden little brother came in beat them up and started putting unequal treaties on them yeah now go figure when money's on the table uh family might not mean all that much sometimes oh and you, you know, you feel it today. I'm at, like, you try to imagine today when you look at trade relations between uh, China and Japan. I don't know how much you know about J Japan and politics, but they've never had a stand. They've never had a very stable relationship. It's actually a bit better right now, but my God, what an awkward relationship for two countries that have all of their trade built upon another. If you imagine we're Canadian, imagine we were. Not at war with the United States, but there was always a Cold War going on with them. But they represented 80% of our trade. It's very awkward. That's how China and Japan were dealing with each other because they were inevitably trading with each other forever. Even, you know, immediately after World War II, they were. But, lack, you know, for lack of better words, they hated each other. Officially. Yeah, well, the sad thing is, is that kind of is the truth today. And 80% is obviously very, very high. But the U.S. and Canada depend on each other very much trade-wise. Yeah. You know, from our end, it's anything from lumber and hydroelectricity. Oil, mostly no. <laughs> yeah, a lot of oil. From the U.S., it's industry, it's steel, it's all these things. And it's... Anytime there's tension between two nations that trade that much, uh, it's, it, it's bound to crack at some point. Yeah. I think from now on, actually, I should probably build this podcast around I do the history and he does the economics. Because this might be actually an interesting little combo. Do you think of it? Although, I I hate that people... You, you find some people are very interested in... in and there, it is a field to study the uh, economic history behind, you know, world events. Really, and it's sad to say, almost everything in history is based around economics. It, you can look at every single grievance, every little war that started, and you can always find a rationale for it. There was a trade disagreement, or you know, one country was not doing so well and it needed to make money because of debts, and it always comes down to it. Well, the reality is, is that pretty much anything you can think of can be looked at as a resource. Yeah, absolutely. Land, population, people, yeah. people, uh, and anything can be looked at as a resource. And and from that point of view, any conflict is based around economics but the the question is is who was on kind of the moral high ground of this and who was kind of trying to make shady deals in this case it was a little bit of both for both sides but uh like i said it'll be interesting for the next episode to see uh what actually went down with the first and the second opium war Ooh. and to see where you know how, how the rest of this played out for both for both sides and other parties that you said will come in later like france and uh maybe the u.s a little bit yeah um yeah people i you know people don't honestly think about it so much but fr france had their hands in the cookie jar for quite a while and they get away with it when w w if you know about the opium war you really think of britain but the second opium war was a 50 50 deal france and britain pretty much shoving an unequal treaty on an already hurt Qing dynasty that lost war horrifyingly and was fighting off a rebellion at the same time it was not really fair to them uh you know before we go because it's like only i'd say about five seven minutes i was just wondering what did you think because i had to give a brief amount of history of westerners coming into china what did you think about the whole story with the people that had to represent britain coming in like Mac you know well the thing is is mccartney it, it, excuse me well, McCartney, I mean, you talked about him a little bit, and it, it seems kind of odd in a sense where, okay, China believes themselves to be superior, other nations want to think of themselves as equals, but you'd think when you're coming in trying to establish a trade that your country depends on so much, 
that you'd kind of bite the bullet. And, you know, nowadays, if you go into a foreign country as an emissary from anywhere, and that country has certain cultures, well, you're always trying to learn those cultures to make them feel comfortable, just in the sense of creating good relations. Whereas back then, everything was about status. Like we said, what kind of tea you had, uh, silk, whatever it might have been, but everything was more not about how much money you made specifically, because things weren't really worked out that way, but it was all about status. And it seems like the British monarchy specifically were kind of turning their noses up and saying, no, 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 we're not going to pretend we're inferior. We're not yeah. going to... And, you know, it's even a common expression nowadays, kowtowing to somebody. It, it was made a common expression to today because of a few British people that had to go to China and do the kowtow. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's, it's funny to see how j just swallowing your pride for those few instances... I'm not saying would have stopped this because I still think it was a natural progression that would have happened yeah. anyways. But just in the sake of keeping up foreign relations... It would have been worth it to, you know, get on your knees and bow to a guy a few times. But that thought of, from the British monarchy of saying, no, no, we're not inferior to anybody and we're not going to pose as such, really might have cost them a lot of headaches that it didn't need to. Again, it probably would have led to this anyways, just based on the needs of both countries and the lack of any other type of currency to deal with. But it might have made the relations a little easier in a sense. They they might have been able to smooth over the conflict or work out other trades to not let it escalate so quickly. Um, so it comes down to a lot of pride, uh, it seems, and real, you know, real unwillingness to admit someone's superiority or yeah. and even just try to make anyone feel comfortable. Especially when back then, again, you're dealing with heavy language barriers. Yeah. And I'm sure in those days, uh, the, the, you know, Google Translate wasn't available, so... I don't think so. So, so somebody from the audience, please check the established date of Google Translate, but uh, I'm pretty sure it wasn't, uh, it was, it wasn't available, especially in an iPhone app back then. Yeah. So, when dealing with foreign relations, you know, they, they really only had the, the hand of maybe a couple translators, and maybe somebody who was somewhat familiar with the culture, but... They, they didn't seem to make any excess efforts to, to to kind of establish good relations other than showering with gifts. But you and said something about the yes. gifts where he brought them over, not even meaning them as tributes or... Oh, the complication was, <laughs> complication was that China had a very rigid system and it was a tributary system. So the emperor expected that you came and he was the great emperor. And usually it was a, a Japanese or Korean official would bring a bunch of gifts. It was a, almost like an annual thing. And they would present them the gifts and then China would go, okay, we're going to trade this. And, and then everyone was pretty happy with this. It's not like China was doing anything unequal to the other nations, despite what a lot of the literature will tell you. When Britain came in, Britain kind of understood what was going on because they had some experience, let's say, with the Native Americans. Uh, because Britain was actually... That's how they did it. They would, they would throw gifts and then expect trade. Uh, but Britain was not willing to be, uh, you know, the underdog in the tributary system. So when they showed up with like 600 gifts with all this extravagant stuff and a balloonist... I do not want to forget about the guy who was operating the balloon. So, because he brought a hot air balloon with a full balloonist, uh, I mean, a, a dude, to operate it. And By the way, just for the folks at home, I have never heard the term balloonist before this podcast. I'm not sure if it's a recognized term. I'm going to go with balloon guy. Yeah, balloon but, guy, sure. Uh, but uh, yeah. if anybody can figure out what happened to this person, I would love to know in the comments because I research forever. There is no mention, if he got home, what happened to him. Because, I mean, the Emperor still took the gifts. The Emperor did not throw the gifts out. And one of the gifts was the balloonist. So I'm really curious what what was the contract like for this for this guy. And, uh, yeah, so the, the British, uh, McCartney shows up thinking, you know, they're going to be on equal terms. And then he's told the kowtow. And he was actually willing to do it as long as the relationship was, you know, two nations just trading with each other. But that was not the case. That's not at all how China operated and that was kind of the the real issue at hand and you can see you know there's Napier comes after McCartney and they keep trying and trying to open up like an official 
what you would call like an embassy within the country so that you can have regular trade agreements because the Qing dynasty was the big dog and they wanted to be the big dog. And yeah. Well, yeah, I think so. a big part of that might be stemming from their earlier trades with Native Americans and stuff because well, them going over and dealing with the Native Americans, the. Don't get me wrong, it's not like they were perceived as gods or anything special like that, but they were bringing stuff that was completely foreign to the Native Americans. They were trading whether it was silverware or blankets or, you know, very, very common things to the Native Americans who were basically, again, giving them loads of stuff for next to nothing. Oh, the 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 Native Americans got the sour end of the deal, as I, I think we can all agree. And it, that, that that's not just territory. Um... If you look at the James Colony, when the foundation, like, basically everybody who came over the first few years was starving and they couldn't feed themselves because they, they built their land on a swamp and they didn't know how to farm and all that. And the natives were keeping them alive by giving them food. And yeah. That's the whole Pocahontas story, actually, and I'm not going to go into that. But uh, coming but coming from that relationship where Britain definitely held the, the, the high ground, for lack of a better word, and then going and having to sort of go back to being a subordinate in china maybe left a bit of a maybe left a bit of a sour taste in their mouth which is why they were were so were so hesitant when it came to you have to remember you know from china's point of view the qing dynasty and i shouldn't even say china it's the qing dynasty they they were the greatest nation they they had no adversaries at the time and you know they kind of knew about britain they had they're not ignorant completely but from Britain's point of view, Britain had fought a lot of wars, and Britain understood naval warfare, and Britain knew they could knock this country out of the water, and they did after. So they weren't really willing to tiptoe around the issues. They they wanted what was in their best interests. And I think that should be enough for this episode, because we keep going off into the bushes with other things. Well, we're, we're always circling back, and, you know... the. All these conflicts have so many tangents that all end up leading to this giant topic of the Pacific War, yeah. which is realizing it it wasn't just one day, one month, one year, one battle. It's 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 a whole subject where so many minute conflicts, minute relationships, economies led to this, and it's you know it's it's, it's good that we can touch a little bit on yeah. everything that led into it or everything it related to. Yeah, uh, the more. The more I've been doing my research, the more I realize that I don't know so much about very specific small countries. Uh, Taiwan, for example, the foundation of Taiwan before Japanese occupation or Chinese occupation. I do not know so much about and I'm going to have to research. Or a country like, let's say, um, Cambodia. Cambodia is dramatically shaped by the Pacific War and the events that led up to it, too. And uh, I really would like to touch on a lot of these smaller countries that get unnoticed. Um, from our Western point of view, the Dutch East Indies. The Dutch were involved <laughs> in this war as well. And uh, not a lot of people talk about them either. And I will not be doing any of that research, but I'll be happy to let this guy fill me in on those things. And Yay. if... If it really comes to a point for one of the episodes, I'd be glad to do some research on the economics specifically of some of these things to see where they tied in and exactly how it was going uh, yeah, you would love, in one of those areas. Uh, if you want to touch the most complicated topic and the one that is the real reason why the Pacific War occurs, it is because of the sale of oil in the 30s. Go figure, a war started because of oil. And that is the start of World War. War Two, not just the Pacific War, actually. Yes. Well, glad we could do this. Thanks for having me, and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys again for the next episode. This has been the Uninformal Podcast for the Pacific War Channel. Over and out. Thanks, guys.